Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan MacDonald, who is passing through on his way to EMNLP, or rather he wasn't passing through, but we persuaded him to change his flight plans and come here instead, and he's going to take an Amtrak bus to, uh, <laughs> to get up to the conference. Yeah. So, uh, so um, the material that Ryan's presenting here, he was saying, is a union of uh, his ACL presentation and what he's presenting at EMNLP. His paper at EMNLP has actually won the Best Paper Award, so... Um, student, student. The student paper yes. award, I'm sorry. It, uh, um, so he's doing stuff on um, dependency parsing, discriminative training, uh, structured outputs, all things that are near and dear to our hearts, and uh, domain adaptation, and so I'll just let him go at it. Oop. So is uh, this on? Okay, it's good. Um, all right, so for those who I haven't met, I'm Ryan McDonald. Um, and I should turn my screensaver off is probably the first thing I should do, but... Since I don't think I plan on spending 15 minutes on a single slide, I'll just forget about that. Um, so this is joint work with a lot of people at the University of Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Um, Kobe Kramer, who's a postdoc there. Um, also with Kirill Riberoff and Jan Hayek at the Charles University in Prague. Uh, Yuan Ding, who has helped us out with some Chinese data sets and is currently actually using some of our work in a machine translation system. And of course, Fernando Pereira, who's my advisor and uh, contributed to uh, a lot of the work here. Okay, so in the natural language processing community, discriminative training has actually become the standard uh, for a lot of problems, most notably information extraction. Uh, entity extraction, relation extraction, things of these nature, uh, discriminative training has really become pervasive, um, as well as things like shallow parsing, and even in machine translation and text summarization, we're seeing discriminative training algorithms uh, really sort of coming to the forefront. And the reason for this is because these models can practically really model large sets of dependent features uh, that is sometimes difficult to do in generative models, like hidden Markov models. Um, whereas these models just do this in a very natural way. So what people have actually asked in the Parson community is whether or not these benefits uh, of discriminative training can actually be applied uh, to parsing. So the earliest attempts um, are that of uh, Adwait Ratnaparki. Um, and his model is actually a locally trained maximum entropy, uh, maximum entropy Markov model, in which local parsing decisions are trained uh, in isolation and then combined at a later stage in some sort of global inference algorithm, in this case, a shift-reduced parsing algorithm. And the benefits of this approach is that you get very efficient training because you're only training these local decisions. Um, but the problem is, as some people have argued, that uh, these algorithms can suffer from something called the label bias problem, um, which is why people have developed sort of global training uh, discriminative models such as conditional random fields and M-cube networks. So that led to uh, globally trained uh, discriminative models. And these uh, take various forms such as log linear models, uh, perceptron models, uh, large margin models. And they all sort of share one common element, and that's that they're trained to maximize the score of the best complete parse relative to all uh, the other parses. But there's a real problem uh, with these global models in that to train them, uh, every, every iteration you actually have to basically parse each sentence, which for lexicalized phrase structure parsing is n to the fifth. And this is true um, for perceptron where you have to do inference, uh, for conditional random fields where you have to do forward, or I guess inside-outside algorithm to calculate expectations. Uh, you have this very cumbersome uh, calculation. So what a lot of these models have done, actually, is either make very aggressive uh, pruning decisions or maybe throw away lexicalization or just run these models on very small sets of data. And as a result, none of these uh, discriminative models have really replaced uh, the generative uh, standards uh, of Michael Collins and Eugene Charniak. We're actually going to look at a different uh, uh, representation uh, outside of phrase structure we're going to look at uh, dependency trees, uh, which model words and their arguments, which are a uh, very common uh, representation in the language processing community. Um, so what you see here, for instance, in this example, John hit the ball with the bat. The verb hit has directed edges in this tree to all its arguments. 
uh, the word John, the word ball, and uh, the preposition with. Um, so there's some constraints. It's got to be a tree. All the words have to be part of the tree. And a lot of things fall out of this, such as each word has exactly one parent. And we also introduce an artificial root node at the leftmost side of the sentence, um, just for convenience, so for some of our algorithms. Now, this is a very impoverished uh, representation of language. Often, we want to actually uh, include uh, syntactic information, grammatical information, such as subjects, objects, whether uh, a certain phrase is a uh, relative clause. And you can actually type these edges to, to actually indicate this. Uh, we're going to focus on untyped trees, primarily for simplicity. But it turns out that um, the typed version is just a very simple extension to all the algorithms uh, we're going to uh, talk about here. In particular, we're going to talk about two types of uh, dependency structures. The first and more common are projective structures. And these structures are basically nested trees. Um, so what that means, I guess, mathematically, or in sort of a graph theoretic uh, standpoint, is if you write all the words of the sentence out in a linear order, you can actually draw the edges of this dependency tree in the plane without any of the edges actually crossing each other. Uh, and these are nested constructions. So these, are, of course, are common uh, for tree banks that are extracted from phrase structure tree banks, which are, of course, nested. So for instance, the English dependency tree bank and the Chinese dependency tree bank, um, which are extracted from the pen tree banks, are going to be exclusively projective. The other type of tree are non-projective trees, of course. Um, and these are trees in which you actually uh, allow for crossing edges. And they are much more common in freer word order languages, such as German, Dutch, um, and Czech, in which the constraints on where arguments actually are relative to each other is not so rigid um, in these languages. And in fact, in the Czech and Danish tree banks, there are actually edges of this form annotated. Uh, and even for English, you can come up with some sentences for which uh, a non-projective representation is actually preferable. So here we have the sentence, I saw a dog yesterday which was black. We have this relative clause which was black that's modifying the dog. But unfortunately, they're separated um, by a temporal modifier to the main verb. So we actually have to introduce a uh, crossing edge here. So why do we want to look at dependency par uh, parsing? Well, first of all, they're an increasingly popular alternative in the natural language processing community. Um, one reason is because they have very nice computational properties. So a lot of formalisms have cubic parsing algorithms as opposed to end of the fifth parsing algorithms for lexicalized phrase structure uh, grammars, uh, such as link grammars, for instance, have uh, cubic parsing algorithms. Also, for many problems, it's been shown uh, that dependency structures are actually quite effective. Uh, some work actually done here on machine translation uh, for relation extraction, synonym generation, uh, all sorts of different uh, standard uh, natural language processing tasks. People have shown that dependency representations actually are uh, quite good. And another reason is we really want to explore any advantages we get from discriminative parsing. And because we have very um, nice computational properties on the parsing algorithms of dependency structures, we're going to actually be able to do that because now we can actually fully and exhaustively uh, train a discriminative learner and see um, how the performance compares to other uh, parsers. So in this talk, I'm going to first talk about the learning framework, which is essentially a large margin perceptron algorithm, um, and sort of give some initial experiments on some sequence data. Then the bulk, of the, the bulk of the talk is actually going to be on a spent tree formulation of dependency trees, which is a fairly straightforward uh, formulation. But what's really nice about it is that it gives us a polynomial parsing algorithms for both projective and non-projective structures. Uh, and then I'm going to take these algorithms plus the learning, uh, uh, the learning algorithm and uh, show some experimental results, uh, defining a feature set. Uh, we have results for English, Czech, and Chinese. And then we're also going to compare the parser uh, to lexicalized context-free parsers, uh, which are sort of the recognized state-of-the-art when it comes to uh, extracting dependencies. Uh, and then finally, uh, if I have time, I'm going to talk about uh, an advantage of dependency pars or discriminative parsing in that we have this rich feature set for which we can define all sorts of different features. And I'm going to show how we can actually uh, use this feature set to improve in and out of domain parsers uh, with auxiliary uh, classifiers. Okay. 
So the learning framework is a multi-class large margin uh, learning framework. So what we're going to assume here, it's a supervised uh, method. So we're going to assume a training set, which is a set of input sentences and parse trees. And we're going to define trees of x to be the set of all possible uh, dependency trees for some sentence. Um, the goal of multi-class large margin learning is to separate the correct parse, which is y tree, from all the incorrect parses uh, with a margin, a score margin, proportional to the loss. And that's the loss of the incorrect tree. And this is something that we have to define, um, but basically what we're trying to do is just separate the correct one from all the incorrect ones. And we can set the, this up as a quadratic programming problem by minimizing the norm of the weight vector subject to satisfying these constraints. And these constraints say that the score of the correct tree minus the score of the incorrect tree has to be greater than or equal to the loss of the incorrect tree. And this has to be true for every single instance in the training set, for all possible trees uh, for every single instance. And this actual formulation uh, was uh, originally proposed by uh, Kramer and Singer uh, for large margin SVM learning. So this all relies on this notion of a loss. We want to actually separate things proportional to a loss. And the loss can be any uh, real valued function uh, with, with certain constraints. But we're actually going to take Hamming distance, uh, which is a common loss to use for sequence data. Um, and for dependency parsing, what that means is it's the number of words in the incorrect tree that have the incorrect parent. So if we have a tree here, John hit the ball with the bat. This is the correct tree right here. This is an incorrect tree. And we see that the prepositional phrase with the bat mistakenly attached to the noun instead of the verb. So the distance between these two trees is, a one, is one. So that's going to be the loss of this incorrect tree. Yeah. Have you thought of different loss functions for parsing that? Yeah. So we, we, we have experimented a little bit with, you know, basic things like zero, one loss. We also experimented, um, we took a little bit of an error analysis on the development set and saw what sort of classes of word, ver, words were making uh, the most mistakes. So for instance, conjunctions and prepositions uh, have the highest error rate. So we tried actually playing with the loss function to penalize those errors more than other errors in the hopes that um, that would sort of make up, uh, make up for that error rate. But we actually found that for almost every loss, the performance was almost the same. Um, and I'm not really sure why that is. Hamming loss always seems to be the best but epsilon, not really um, much. And actually, talking with Ben Tasker at um, Berkeley, um, for sequence data, he found it also to be the case. And I don't really have a good motivation why that, that is, but yeah. yeah it's just like this Hamming loss is very local, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the nice thing about Hamming loss, which is, is that it's, we're optimizing something um, that's directly related to our accuracy, right? Because um, basically we're measuring per word parent accuracy. And that's exactly what Hamming loss uh, is measuring here. So, which is probably why at the end of the day it's, um, it comes out the best. But again, not by much. Okay, so what's the problem with this uh, formulation? So many of you have probably um, realized that the number of constraints in this quadratic program are huge. Uh, we have a constraint for every single incorrect dependency tree for every single instance, which is, of course, exponential. Um, so we can't actually do these optimizations. So people have done this for sequences before, and the two common solutions are to factor the constraints. So factor the constraints subject to some uh, motivatable factorization on the output structure. Uh, so you get a polynomial number of constraints. This was Ben Tasker's formulation for uh, M-cube networks. And another option is just to sample constraints in some meaningful way. So you get uh, a good subset of samples, and then you do a global inference on only a small sample of the constraints for each instance. But both solutions actually still lead to large quadratic programming problems, because you're, um, you're still doing optimization on constraints for every single instance in the training set, which is 40,000 uh, instances for English parsing. So we actually decided to just take a very simple solution here. We first made learning purely online. So we're only going to have quadratic programming problems for a single instance at a time. Um, and then instead of having constraints for all the incorrect trees, we're just going to have constraints for the k best parses with the current weights, because everything's online. So we're constantly updating the weight uh, setting. So we're only going to have constraints uh, for the k best trees uh, relative to that, that weight setting. And so what does this look like? 
Uh, well, we call it the large margin perceptron, which is actually just a uh, generalization of the margin infused relaxed algorithm uh, to structured data. And so for each instance in the training data, and we iterate over the training data uh, a number of times, we find the k-best trees for that instance. And then we're going to create a set of constraints using these k-best trees. And the constraints are that the score for the correct tree has to be greater than the score for the incorrect tree proportional to the loss only for the k-best trees. And because this is online, we don't want to minimize the norm subject to these constraints because that means we're going to throw out all the work we've done in previous instances. So what we do is we say, well, the previous weight vector we have is actually meaningful to us because we've created that based on what we've learned in previous instances. So we say make the smallest change possible in the weight vector. So that's the old weight vector W. Find the new weight vector that is different from that old weight vector by the smallest amount. Take that weight vector that's subject that satisfies these constraints. And so this is uh, Myra, the margin infused relaxation algorithm, applied to structure output, in particular dependency trees here, but you can apply it to any um, structured output in which you can do k-best inference. So the advantages are that we have very quick uh, quadratic programming problems that be, can be solved uh, by Hildreth's algorithm, which is a very simple to implement uh, uh, QP solver. Uh, it's a perceptron variant. It only relies on inference, which is good because you have to code up inference anyways. Um, we need k-best inference, which for nested parsing is typically easy because uh, it's a bottom-up dynamic programming uh, approach. And there's lots of algorithms out there. But it turns out that for some cases, that can be tricky. And I'll talk about that later. And typically, our experiments show that in terms of k-best inference, we only really need k to be between 5 and 10 to get optimal performance. And actually, even as k grows, sometimes you see performance starting to go down. Um, so this is good. So we're still sticking to very small quadratic programming uh, problems. And it's simple to implement because we already have inference. This is just a uh, QP solver. But the disadvantages, or one disadvantage uh, that sort of comes to mind is that this is just an approximation. We're not actually uh, solving the original QP we wanted to. Um, so how does this actually turn out in uh, experiments? So we actually compared Myra to the average perceptron algorithm, which is another online algorithm, to conditional random fields, which is a batch uh, maximum likelihood algorithm, and M cube networks, uh, which is a more principled large margin structured uh, approach. And what we can see is that in terms of performance, Myra is consistently near the top, consistently as good as conditional random fields, uh, usually better than the percept, usually statistically better than the average perceptron algorithm, at least for sequences. Uh, NP chunking, it's not the case. Um, so what you get is this nice balance that Myra has all the nice properties of online learning, but it actually does nearly as well as batch learning algorithms like conditional random fields and uh, M cube networks. Uh, and I'll just note that this result here, conditional random fields is terrible on handwritten digit recognition, has to do with the normalization used um, for this task. So we actually use Ben Tasker's normalization that he gave us, that he gave us, feature normalization. Yeah. We did actually. So we um, did have, we do have an implementation with uh, Slack variables. I don't talk about them just for simplicity and also because they actually didn't change performance uh, for, uh, for our methods. Actually, for the sequence data, they did. Slack variables did help on the sequence data. What's that? It, it wasn't completely separable, but on the training set, you did get something like 99 points something percent. It was, it was close to separable because we use a very rich uh, feature set, a dimension in the size of uh, 6 to 10 million that basically made it uh, separable. But, but yeah, but we, we did have an implementation with Slack. Right? So, so for, for your um, online learning, can you prove that it is convergent? Or? Yeah, for this, it's the same sort of proof that uh, perceptron algorithm uh, just extends. It's actually the original uh, Myra paper has all those proofs as well. And it's easy to show that even with this k-best approximation, um, you can still prove all those converging properties. <coughs> OK, so that's basically the learning framework we're going to use, a large margin perceptron learning framework. Uh, we're just going to assume it for the rest of the talk. And now I'm going to move on to dependency parsing. Um, so what we're going to first do is make a first order tree factorization for dependency parsing. And then I'll back away from this later, but this is just 
uh, what I want to do now. And it's a common practice uh, where we just factor dependency tree scores by edges. So a little terminology. We're going to let x be a sentence with words x1 to xn. Uh, y is going to be a dependency tree. And if you view a dependency tree as a set of edges, you can say that ij is an element of the tree to indicate that there's an edge from i, uh, word xi to word xj in the tree. So xi is the parent of xj. And the uh, edge-based factorization, or the first-order factorization, says that the score of the dependency tree is the sum over all the edges in the tree, uh, the score of that edge. So right off the bat, you can already see how we're going to equate this to a uh, maximum spanning tree framework, because basically we're just saying uh, it's the score of all the edges. And we call this a first-order factorization because scores are relative to a single edge in the tree. So it's a discriminative framework. We're going to just take a standard uh, linear classifier approach. So we're going to define the score of an edge to be the dot product between a high-dimensional fe feature representation of that edge. And I'll define what that is uh, in the experiment section. And a corresponding weight vector, which is actually what we want to learn um, uh, during training. And so this is sort of a standard representation, which means that the score of a tree is, again, just the sum over all the edges uh, in this dot product. And of course, as I said, edge-based factorization sounds familiar. Um, it's basically uh, a well-known factorization uh, for the maximum spanning tree problem, uh, which for directed graphs, which is what we're actually considering here, uh, is also known as maximum branching or the arb ar arborescence problem, uh, in particular because we have a unique root, because we've actually defined a unique root. And that's what, so it's actually exactly this problem here, which people in the 60s and 70s referred to it as this, Later on, I think now people refer to it as that. We call it maximum spanning trees because I guess it's just more familiar uh, terminology uh, to people. Uh, directed maximum spanning tree is what you can call it. And basically what it is, is given a directed graph uh, with a score function for every single edge in that graph, an MST of G is basically the subgraph with highest score that happens to be a tree. So it's weakly connected. Each node has at most one incoming edge. and it, originates from a unique predefined root, um, which is what we have here. So dependency parsing as MSTs is a fairly straightforward uh, mental leap. We just consider a sentence and we just define a graph such that the vertices are all the words in the graph. And we put an edge between every single word, every single pair of words uh, in the sentence, as well as an edge between the root and all words. So we have no incoming edges to the root. We only have edges going out from the root. And then every single word has an edge to itself. So it's almost a dense graph uh, modulo the root. So we create this graph. Uh, an example is the sentence, John saw Mary. Um, we can assume that we have uh, this graph here, which has an edge between uh, every pair of words and an edge from the root to every uh, word. And the maximum spanning tree of this graph is John saw Mary. And clearly, the highest score in maximum spanning tree is also the highest score in dependency tree because they're basically just the highest scoring tree. Um, you know, and we can constrain this to be projective trees or non-projective trees if we want. Um, so a very simple sort of uh, formulation here. So what we need to do now, using this formulation, is actually to define maximum spanning tree parsing algorithms. It turns out that the Eisner algorithm um, is a uh, maximum spanning tree algorithm for the projective case, assuming a linear ordering on the vertices, which we have in English because we have the order of the words in the sentence. And for the non-projective case, we can just use the Chu Liu Edmonds maximum spanning tree algorithm, uh, which is a greedy-based algorithm uh, for finding the best non-projective uh, spanning tree, which is a little unfamiliar uh, in the language processing community. So I can't really go into all the specifics about these algorithms, but I'll try to give you a general intuition for how they work. Uh, the Eisner algorithm is a bottom-up chart parsing algorithm very similar to CKY. It's n cubed in time. Uh, the way it works is by separating um, constituents by left and right-hand sides. So a word will gather all its dependents to the right-hand side and all its dependents to the left-hand side uh, independently of each other. So we see here we have the right-hand side, a subtree of saw, and we want to actually gather the dependent man. So the first step is actually to just create an incomplete item where we've gathered half the side of the dependent. And we say the score of this new uh, constituent is going to be the score of the subtrees 
plus the score of actually creating the edge from saw to man, then at a later stage, we gather the, sub, the right subtree of man. So the score of the final constituent is going to be the score of this subtree plus the score of this subtree. And so we do this for the left and right-hand side, and we just build it up from bottom up to the top, and then we just take the highest scoring constituent rooted at the unique root node. And then we just take back pointers, the same way Viterbi algorithm, you can keep back pointers, and we actually extract uh, the tree. And this is n cubed because each constituent, uh, you need to uh, keep two indices, the left and rightmost indice of each constituent. And to fill a constituent, you need to iterate over the middle indice here to actually uh, f find the best uh, subtree for this constituent. So it's three indices you have to keep track of. Uh, it's n cubed. So this is uh, the Eisner projective algorithm. And it's projective because um, everything, we, we gather constituents at a time. So we're always working with subtrees, and then we're bringing them together without actually uh, crossing any edges. We're never actually creating any crossing edges as we parse upwards. For the non-projective case, uh, we can turn to um, a little bit of graph theory, the uh, Chu Liu Edmonds uh, MST algorithm, which is a very old algorithm uh, from the 60s. Um, and basically, this algorithm, it's not a bottom-up parsing algorithm, which a lot of us are used to. Um, this is actually a greedy recursive algorithm. And the way this algorithm works is, what it does is it finds for every single word in the sentence, it finds the highest incoming edge into that word. And what you can show is that if, that, if the result of that process is a tree, then it's obviously the maximum spanning tree, because no edge switch can actually lead to a higher scoring tree. If it's not a tree, that means that there's got to be a cycle somewhere in that process. And what the algorithm does is it contracts that cycle into a single node and recalculates scores coming into and out of the node. And you can actually show that this new subgraph, a maximum spanning tree in that new graph, is actually a maximum spanning tree in the original graph. So you just recursively call the algorithm. And to see how this works, let's just go through an example. So this is the old example. John saw Mary um, with these edge weights. So the first step is to find the highest incoming edge to every single word in the sentence. And of course, the root has no incoming edges, so there's going to be no edge for the root node. And what we see is that this is not a tree. Um, so the highest scoring incoming edge to Mary is from Saw, uh, from John is from Saw, and then we have this incorrect edge here, because for some reason it's more likely that John goes into Saw than the root goes into Saw, which is unlikely, but this is you know, just for to, just for an example. So what we have is actually that there's a cycle, and there has to be a cycle if you don't have a tree. Um, so what we're going to do is actually take this cycle and contract it. And the way we contract it, so this node represents uh, a single node which represents this entire cycle. So we contract this node, and the first thing we do in this contracted graph is every single edge that doesn't go into or out of this cycle, we just leave in the graph as is, because it's not actually affected. Uh, by the cycle. So the only edge here is from root to marry. And now for every other outgoing edge from this cycle, we take the highest scoring edge that's actually outgoing. So for instance, the edge from this, the highest scoring outgoing edge into marry from this cycle is from saw and not from John. So John is 11, saw is 30, so we actually take the edge as 30. Now to calculate the incoming edges, what we do, this is based on the observation that um, the maximum spanning tree has to contain all the edges in the cycle except for one, which is going to be the edge that's going to break that cycle. There's going to be an incoming edge into that cycle that breaks it. And all the other edges have to be in that cycle because if you show, if you pick an arbitrary maximum spanning tree that doesn't have all those other edges except for the one breaking it, you can always reinsert one of these edges and get a higher score. Uh, the proof is fairly straightforward. Um, but hopefully that's enough intuition. So basically what we want to do is we know that all these edge, edges, modulo 1 in the cycle, is actually going to be in the final uh, maximum spanning tree. So what we want to do when calculating edges into the cycle is to calculate um, if this edge came into this cycle, what would be the maximum spanning tree of this node and all the nodes in the cycle. And in this case, it's going to be root goes to saw goes to John. Because the other option is root goes to John goes to saw, which is 29, and this is 40. So that's going to be the edge weight, because it represents the best possible 
spanning tree containing all these nodes here. And since we know that all these edges have to be in this modulo, the one that's going to break the cycle, um, this is uh, what the edge weight into it is going to be. And we also have to compute the edge weight from Mary, which is going to be 31 because... Uh, no, it should be 30, sorry, because the highest scoring spanning tree is 0, 30 instead of 3, 20. So we now have a contracted graph. And a fundamental property that Chu Liu Edmonds all showed, um, and has been showed uh, again in, in many various forms, is that an MST in this contracted graph is an MST in the original graph. So what we want to do is actually recursively call um, our algorithm on this new graph. And once we do that, uh, we'll eventually terminate, because we can't keep contracting the graph infinite, uh, for an infinite amount of time. And then we'll just reconstruct the graph. So we do it again. Take the MST in this graph. We get this graph, which is a tree. So this has to be the MST of this graph. And then we just expand everything. We just remember where this edge came from and where this edge went into. And we just um, create the new graph. And we get this nice new uh, MST. OK. So uh, the Chu Liu Edmonds algorithm is easily implemented in cubic time. Uh, finding the in highest incoming edge in the contraction phase you can actually do in n squared. And you have to do that at most n different times because every single time you contract, you eliminate one node, so you're only going to have to do it n times. It turns out that there's actually an n squared implementation for dense graphs, um, which is what we have here because we have edges between all nodes. And of course, you can add edges to the root node and just give it weight infinity. Um, it's somewhat complicated. We actually implemented it, and it did lead to modest improvements uh, in terms of parsing, perf not parsing performance, in terms of efficiency. Performance is actually, of course, equal. Um, but we've actually reverted back to the n cubed algorithm uh, because it's just, for people modifying the code, people at Penn who are modifying the code, it's actually just a much easier piece of code to actually look at and modify. And the difference is, is modest, but not, uh, not too much. Uh, the downside is that this isn't a bottom-up algorithm. This is a top-down, not top-down either, just a recursive greedy algorithm. So it's really hard to come up with k-best uh, implementations for this algorithm. And there is one um, who uh, has one, but it runs an end of the sixth. Uh, so that's actually not that practical uh, for our purposes. So we're sort of constrained when using this algorithm to use k equals 1. And that's what we actually do. Okay. So this spanning tree parsing formalism, a uh, single parsing framework for projective and non-projective trees, uh, both problems have tractable algorithms, which is very nice. So we get this sort of blanket formalism that gives us algorithms for both the projective and non-projective case. Uh, leads to competitive performance with other parsers, which I'm going to talk about soon. But a lot of people have actually sort of mentioned to me this sort of first-order edge-based factorization is really hard to motivate. Uh, most parsers actually um, do quite well when they condition on previous parse history, previous parse decisions, which we haven't done. We sort of do it in a quasi-manner by having all sorts of features that sort of give us indications for what previous parse decisions might be, but we never actually explicitly do it. So we should actually condition on at least some parse history. Um, so we actually looked at second-order MST parsing. And these are, uh, these are subtrees in which the score is now not factored by single edges, but by pairs of adjacent edges. So we see the score for John hit the ball yesterday um, has the score for hit the ball and hit yesterday. So we have a score for this pair of edges. And we also have a score for this pair of edges. Um, hit goes to yesterday and hit goes to width. We don't have a score for this pair of edges, adjacent pair of edges, because we're actually going to maintain the left-right uh, independence assumption. And we maintain this because this will still give us cubic parsing algorithms for the projective case. Um, so this, at least now, we can actually have features over previous parsing decisions, which will allow us to do things like eliminate cases where a verb takes two subjects to the left or something like that, which could have happened in the edge-based factorization. Unlikely, but it still could have. There was nothing actually preventing it, no features uh, preventing it necessarily. So you only have the second-order dependencies for the arguments of the, the groups for the no, no, but no for all, all words. But the thing is, these words, there's no adjacent edges. So width only has one. 
uh, one child. If with had other children, there'd actually be second order dependencies for that. It's for every single word. It just turns out that hit is the only word that has uh, adjacent pairs of uh, edges. A very short sentence, so that's not, to be, that's n not surprising. And for lar larger sentences, you see a lot more uh, pairs of adjacent edges. So, so maintaining this left and right independence assumption uh, screws you when you're trying to get uh, 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 crossing brackets, right? Or the, um... No, the, the problem here is you can't, so the Eisner trick, so the reason the Eisner gets an n cubed algorithm is because he splits left and right parsing, right? And if all of a sudden you have scores over uh, decisions that happen on the left and the right, you can't really keep that cubic parsing. You can actually show that you can add these scores by adding a factor of n, so an n to the fourth parsing algorithm. Uh, but we just wanted to keep cubic. Uh, if you use the MST algorithm, then you can still get non-projective. Uh, well, actually, it turns out that you can't actually, the non-projective case with second order parsing is NP-complete, uh, which I, I'm, I'm going to show you in a second. So this actually sort of uh, hurts us here. But, um, for the projective case, anyways, a simple extension to the Eisner algorithm, which is actually noted in his original paper, you can actually pick up uh, these dependencies. So what we do, instead of collecting a single dependent at a time, we group pairs of dependents, and we create this sort of sibling chart item, uh, which just has two dependencies that don't have a parent yet. And when we collect them, we collect them both at the same time. So now the score of saw uh, going to width is going to be the score of the subtree A, the score of the subtree D, plus adding uh, a pair of edges from saw to man and saw to width. And this is still cubic because we still are only maintaining three indices at any given time. Um, you have a little bit of uh, additional uh, constants because now you have uh, another chart item which you actually have to maintain, uh, but it's not bad. It's actually only a factor of two, um, so which you know is not that great, but still it's it's doable anyways. But it's cubic, which is the, uh, the nice property of this algorithm. For the non-projective case, um, second order and any higher order parsing is actually NP-complete. And you can show this uh, with a reduction from three-dimensional uh, matching, which is a, a very simple reduction. Um, and this is actually true even if we make the left-right independence assumption or if we don't make the left-right. That has, doesn't actually uh, matter in terms of uh, NP-completeness. So what we're going to do is actually make an observation. And the observation is that even in non-projective languages like Czech uh, and Danish, the trees are primarily projective. Usually there's only one or two non-projective edges uh, in these trees. So can we actually come up with an approximation um, that uses this fact for the uh, uh, second order non-projective case? And this is a little bit of pseudocode. Uh, you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, but basically the the way the approximation works is we first start with the high scoring projective algorithm. So we first find the high scoring projective algorithm, and then we enter this seemingly infinite loop. And what this loop does is it looks for changes in edges, changes in parents, that actually lead to an increase uh, in overall score of the tree. And on every iteration of the loop, we find the single edge that increases the score of the tree the most. And we make that change at the end of the loop only if that edge change actually leads in a higher scoring tree. So this actually terminates because there's finite, there's exponentially many, but there's only a finite number of parse trees. And in each iteration, we're finding a tree with higher score, so we're eventually going to have to terminate. So, and also this has to introduce non-projective edges uh, because um, if it changes an edge and you get another projective tree, our exact second order projective parsing algorithm would have actually returned that as the highest scoring tree. So uh, the algorithm gets you to terminate. However, it's really hard to balance loop. I haven't actually done it yet. I know it's at least n to the eighth. Uh, and I think it's actually higher. Um, so that's not good at all. But in practice, because there's only ever one or two edges being changed, the loop actually really only iterates once or twice. And because we apply these algorithms with discriminative learning, uh, we're actually learning relative to this approximate inference algorithm. So we learn relative to the sorts of errors that this sort of ad hoc post-process step might actually make. And so the algorithm actually learns only to make one or two changes, uh, uh, one or two changes from the projective parser. So actually, in terms of parsing time, there's really no difference between this approximate second order parsing non-projective algorithm and the projective case. 
OK, so on to experiments. Uh, so we extract the dependencies from the English, Czech, and Chinese uh, data sets. Czech actually annotates dependencies, so that was a good data set. And we use some head rules for Chinese and English uh, to extract the data that actually to extract the dependencies. And we use k equals 1 for all experiments with Myra. Um, for the projective case, using large value, larger values of k actually give us a little bit better performance. But just for simplicity, we're just going to use k equals 1 uh, for every single uh, experiment. Because our uh, non-projective algorithms, we don't have k best inference. OK, so the feature set, we have to actually define uh, features over edges and pairs of edges. Um, so we have simple features like the word, the prefix, and part of speech identities for the two words actually participating in the dependency relation. Uh, part of speech for the uh, words in the dependency relation and the words in between. So some features over the words occurring in between uh, the two words in the dependency relation. As well as part of speech of context words. So word to the left of the parent, word to the right of child, etc. And we can join all these features with uh, the direction of attachment, whether the attachment is coming from the right or the left, and the distance. Distance is, of course, really important because we tend not to like very long distance uh, dependencies, except for with things like verbs uh, that uh, it's sort of, uh, for long sentences, uh, it's unavoidable. Um, and the second order features are just, because these are over triples of words, we didn't want to have trigram word features because that just exploded the feature set. So we just use triples of part of speech tags over the parent and the two children in the, uh, in the uh, uh, dependency relations, the uh, two children in the dependency relations, as well as the identities of the two children to sort of have features indicating whether or not two words are likely to be siblings uh, in a dependency tree. And I should say that actually these contexts and part of speech uh, uh, Features are extremely important. If you just use features over the two words uh, that are in the dependency relation, the parser actually doesn't do well at all. And that's because you need, especially for the first order model, because you need some notion of what's happening around those two words. So for instance, a noun attached to a noun with a verb in between is a very unlikely event. And these features uh, give you that. Uh, Are you using lower part of speech tags here? No, I use, um, I just take uh, the, uh, MX post, and I just use the output of that. Uh, sorry, a maximum entropy be part of speech tagger, and I just use the output of that. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the error, over 10% of the error rate, is from the fact that we're using noisy part of speech tags. We actually do, when we actually do use gold part of speech tags, we get a large uh, increase in performance. Um, so that's actually one area of further improvement um, for this parser. So. OK, so these are projective results. These are only for um, uh, projective parsers. Uh, we're doing it for English, Czech, and Chinese. We're measuring accuracy, which is the parent accuracy, the number of words that correctly identify, percentage of words that correctly identify their parent, as well as the number of sentences they get the complete analysis uh, correct. And what we can see here, compared to other projective parsers, uh, the Yamada and Matsumoto locally trained SVM parter, Yokum Niver has two parsers, uh, one a, a memory-based English parser, and then he extended that to Czech uh, as well recently this year. And then we have our first-order projective parser uh, with the discriminative uh, large margin perceptron and our second-order projective parser. We can see even the first-order model already uh, does pretty well when compared um, to other uh, dependency parsers. And when we move to the second-order parser, uh, we get uh, a nice improvement, uh, a pretty good improvement in terms of accuracy, uh, especially for Chinese. We see uh, almost a 3% uh, improvement there. And for complete correct analysis, we do see a pretty big jump. And that's, of course, because now we're you know, parsing based with uh, previous parse decisions in mind. Uh, so this was a very promising results for the projective case. For the non-projective case, we looked at check because they had, this data set actually has non-projective edges uh, annotated in it. This is Joachim Niver's uh, check parser in which he introduces non-projective edges um, by uh, labeling edges in a projective parser such that you can do a post-processing transformation step. So the labels of the edges actually indicate things like raising and lowering of dependencies that will introduce non-projective edges. Um, 
and even our first order projective algorithm does better, but this is it's hard to compare these because he uses a very um, uh, approximate linear time parsing algorithm. So he doesn't search the space of parses uh, completely. So he's probably, uh, his performance is probably reflected uh, by that. But so we see what we get is uh, from the first order projective models uh, to the, or the, from the projective models to the non-projective models, we do see that we're actually starting to pick up a lot of these non-projective edges. In particular, there's only 2% uh, non-projective edges in the Prague tree bank, and we're already picking up half of them uh, with these algorithms. Uh, so the second order approximate non-projective algorithm uh, actually uh, gives us very good, re very good results. And uh, uh, I think at IWPT, there might be papers that have numbers approaching this. But so far, it's sort of the best uh, reported uh, single parse results for this data set. OK. So Yamada and Matsumoto um, compared their parser to lexicalized context-free parsers and showed that these parsers actually have higher accuracy uh, than most dependency parsers. And the reason for this is that they're much richer. They have a lot more information uh, to condition on. They have a lot more syntactic information. So we wanted to actually compare our parsers to the uh, standard lexicalized uh, phrase structure parsers. So we looked at Collins and Charniak. And what we can see is that our second order projective parser, uh, this is the English data set, so we're just doing projective parsing, uh, it does pretty well. It's actually just as good as the Collins parser, and it's a little bit worse than the Charniak parser. Uh, but this is statistically significant, so that is actually uh, a little worse than the Charniak parser. However, we can sort of um, use the fact that our uh, dependency parser is discriminative. And we have this tool, which is the feature set, that we can define all sorts of features over it. So what we actually do is we say, well, let's just add features that indicate the decisions of the Collins and Charniak parsers, right? So how well, right? What does the Collins and Charniak parser think? And then learn relative to the errors that these parsers are going to make. And of course, we get this big improvement because we get this nice combination of the sorts of decisions Collins and Charniak made combined with the discriminative learning technique. And we get this nice big improvement. Yeah? So, uh, so how do you get parses from Collins and Charniak? This is, this is all trained on the training section of the tree. That's panel. right. So you do like, uh, splitting of the training set, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, because these guys, since they train on that, they obviously do very well in the training data, and it's not appropriate. We actually just do a very simple splitting. We just take the training data, split it in half, and then train it on each other, exactly, yeah, to extract the features. Um, and actually, this trick is really just combining parsers with voting, or without voting, I should say. Um, so people have looked at parser combo methods in the past, most notably uh, Henderson and Brill and Dan Zeman uh, in Prague. And most of these methods rely on some sort of voting scheme. Uh, which has sort of typical, a lot of problems. First of all, they require tie-breaking schemes because um, sometimes it's just ties. If, you know, they equally vote for various constituents or various dependency edges. Um, they consider all parser votes equal, which is not true. Um, typically, Charniak's parser is the most accurate, so we should really consider that parse to be, uh, to have the highest vote, but it's hard to actually quantify this. Um, Henderson and Brill actually suggest solutions to this by learning a naive base classifier and some held out set of data to actually learn weights for each parser, um, which is actually uh, improved performance. And the other problem is voting doesn't always guarantee a consistent parse. Um, so you could have crossing brackets, or you could have, um, you could have in dependency parsing words with multiple parents or words with no parents and stuff like that. Um, there, are con there are conditions where you can guarantee a consistent parse, but you don't always have those conditions met. And so you always have to sort of deal with um, how to make sure that the output of the voting leads to a consistent parse. Whereas this method, just sort of adding features from parses, you get all these things. You get no tie-breaking scheme. It learns parser weight, so it's probably learning that the Charniak parser is the most reliable. And it always guarantees a consistent parse, because it's just integrated into a normal parser. So we just get a consistent parse. Yeah. So are you learning uh, regularity of these other parsers, like where they might make errors? And what yes. No, no, we're not combining them by phoning. We actually just add features. So for a given edge, we'll add a feature that says um, Charniak parser believed this edge existed, right? And we actually also add features that say um, the Charniak parser believed this edge existed and the parent part of speech is X and the child part of speech is Y. So it actually might identify cases where those parsers really make uh, mistakes. So those are sorts of features. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, no, no, we don't have uh, this feature. Exactly, and actually, it's funny enough, I was thinking about that on the plane on the way over, why you should really have, uh, for all the auxiliary parsers you use, features uh, conjoining them, because you can just take add weights parser and add features and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, this was actually just a simple experiment, and it was very nice that we got this large improvement, but I'm sure if we took, you know, DK and Ling's parser, we took add weights parser and the plethora of parsers out there and just threw in all sorts of features, um, we get improved performance. Of course, I should notice the problem here is that we rely on the output of these parsers, which are lexicalized phrase structure parsers, which are, of course, much slower to run than our dependency parser. Um, so we actually, even though we get this nice performance increase, we take a real hit in parsing uh, uh, efficiency. So basically, if you like efficiency, then the dependency, the pure dependency parser is probably better. But if you like performance, then it's a simple trick. Um, it turns out that you can actually use the same trick for adapting a parser to new domains. Um, so when we're looking to parse a new domain, so we actually look to parse in biomedical data at Penn. Uh, Simon was telling me that you guys look to parse uh, technical documents a lot here. Um, we don't always have 40,000 plus annotated sentences to actually train a state-of-the-art parser. So is there anything we can do? Can we actually use the fact that we do have 40,000 sentences uh, for Wall Street Journal to actually parse these new domains? Um, a paper by Matt Lees and Eugene Charniak at IJCNLP this year uh, gives some uh, general techniques for uh, handling the case when you don't have any data that deal with sort of uh, using part of speech features as well as constraining uh, the parser to obey maybe entity bracketings and things like this that you might know for the new domain. Uh, but we actually want to look at the case when there's a small amount. We have a small amount of annotated data. We have resources actually annotate a few hundred sentences in the new domain. Uh, can we actually use this Wall Street Journal parser uh, to increase performance? Uh, obviously, one thing you can do is just train a model with all the Wall Street Journal sentences and all the new domain sentences. But that's really bad, because you have 40,000 Wall Street Journal sentences and a few hundred new domain sentences. So you're basically going to get a Wall Street Journal parser uh, back. It's going to completely dominate the uh, parameters uh, of this new parser. Um, so we're, again, going to use a feature set, as we normally do when extending these parsers. We have a discriminative model. We can define any features. So we're just going to add features indicating decisions of the Wall Street Journal parser, the same way we added features uh, indicating the decisions of the Collins, and Char the Collins and Charniac parser for the in-domain parsing. What this allows us to do is we're going to train a parser in-domain on data sets specific to that domain using a lot of out-of-domain evidence, basically the Wall Street Journal. So for these experiments, we had 2,600 annotated biomedical sentences. I divided training uh, into overlapping sets of 100, 200, 300, and 400 sentences. Uh, I just used a small development of 100 sentences and uh, a testing of 2,000 sentences. So we have a reasonably uh, large size uh, testing set. So we get a, a nice graph here. This red line represents uh, how well the Wall Street Journal parser did on the biomedical text. So it does around 80.5%, uh, which is actually not that bad. But compared to the fact that we're getting 92% on the English data, that's a significant drop uh, in performance. This curve is the curve if we just train on biomedical data. So on 100, training on 100 instances of biomedical, me, biomedical data, we only really get about 76.5%, maybe 77% accuracy. So actually, we're, we're much worse than the Wall Street Journal parser uh, with just 100 uh, sentences. But as expected, quickly, even by 250 sentences, we've already surpassed training uh, on 40,000 Wall Street Journal sentences. This last curve is just adding features from the Wall Street Journal parser. We just trained the same model here with the additional feature saying, uh, some decisions from the Wall Street, like what does the Wall Street Journal parser actually believe happen? And we could see very early on, we get this huge boost in performance, which actually is maintained even uh, to as many as 500 uh, sentences. So this is a nice trick which allows us to train a new parser in a new domain uh, while sort of using uh, a lot of evidence we have in other domains. Okay. So to summarize, I uh, basically just uh, talked about dependency parsing as a uh, maximum spanning tree uh, formulation. And it's a, a uniform framework. It's very nice because it gives us all sorts of, it gives us a nice uh, theoretical and algorithmic uh, a framework to actually talk about these things, to talk about projective and non-projective parsing algorithms. And for the first order case, we get 
uh, very efficient parsing algorithms. And for the second order case, for the projective case, we actually do get efficient. But for non-projective, we have to make some approximation. And it results in a very high empirical performance when combined with discriminative learning, uh, which is very nice. And because we're using discriminative learning, uh, we're robust to appro approximations, um, which is the case for the second order uh, non-projective. We actually have run some experiments on Danish, which annotates multiple parents, which is an even uh, harder uh, dependency. Rep it's no longer a tree, of course. It's a dependency representation uh, to actually parse. And it turns out that uh, it does quite well uh, with approximation algorithms for Danis in, in annotating multiple parents. Uh, we get this nice parser combo method without voting, and we get consistent parses. And we can easily adapt the parser to new domains uh, using uh, a feature set that can actually add evidence from uh, Wall Street Journal parses. OK, so future work. I need to do this uh, for my thesis, um, actually look at what features are important and what features aren't. I just sort of take the engineering standpoint right now and just throw everything at it and assume that the discriminative learner is going to figure out what's good and what's bad. But we really need to know um, from a linguistic standpoint uh, what features are actually important uh, to make independency uh, decisions uh, in this framework. Uh, we want to apply the parser. Currently, uh, Yuan Ding at Penn is using it uh, for his MT system. Uh, we're actually uh, really developing these for relation extraction from biomedical text. Um, so uh, we have some data that's actually been annotated with parse trees, entities, and relations. And we really want to look at joint structures uh, for extracting entities, relations, and dependency structures uh, in a discriminative framework where you can define rich features over all these uh, structures, and even loss functions over different parts of the structures if you want to optimize, let's say, relations versus optimizing uh, dependencies. We also want to look at semi-supervised parsing. So um, there's some things you can do. First of all, there's an observation. Uh, Simon and I were talking about this, that um, bilexical features are not that indicative uh, because the, uh, the uh, parameter estimates are just not reliable. So can you actually create word clusters using large sets of unlabeled data that will allow you to actually um, improve parsing because you have a coarser grained representation of word over the bigram? Uh, representations. And this is very similar uh, to what Scott Miller did. I think, sorry, that should be Miller et al. Um, did when he used word clusters to improve uh, entity extraction. Uh, at ACL this year, Ando and Zhang actually presented a very nice paper where they used uh, what they call predictive embeddings, which is basically just the low dimensional embedding of uh, classifiers that have been trained on large amounts of unlabeled data where they extract uh, auxiliary problems based on um, predicting a particular word in the sentence or a particular part of speech in the sentence, which you can get for large amounts uh, of data. And they actually showed that this sort of uh, semi-supervised learning approach actually does lead to a large improvement. So we're actually trying to extend this now uh, to dependency parsing. And another thing that's uh, come about recently is uh, the LASSO, Learning as Search Optimization Framework of Hal Dom and Daniel Marku. Um, that actually really formalizes in a nice way our intuitions as to why discriminative online learning is very robust to approximations. By formalizing this uh, in a, uh, where they define a search space and a, um, and a uh, what's it called? Just a, a priority of decisions across that search space. And they make updates relative to that space. Um, and they have all sorts of uh, proofs that show why this is a good thing and really good experimental results so we want to actually create parsing algorithms within this framework and use the same sort of updates as this framework and hopefully improve upon the current approximate uh, parsing algorithms uh, that we have right now. And yeah, that's it. And thanks to Simon for uh, inviting me here today. So I guess we have time. Do we have questions? So on the, on the training, uh, Bass, and you just pretty much been one bath. So that means that you're finding the most likely tree. That's right. But the impact of that will have will depend also on loss relative to the label tree. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So is there a way to find the maybe combine those find the most likely tree that has a big loss or something? Yeah, like that? and actually we did do that. So you can actually change your inference algorithm and find the tree that breaks that's actually breaks the loss constraint the most. Yeah. 
um, you just add sort of, for, as you're building up the tree, you just add what the loss of the tree is, and you just, it's all additive. So you can actually find the tree that breaks the constraints the most and do updates on that tree. But actually, that does a lot worse. And the reason is, you know, it's, it's actually a really good idea, but the reason is, the reason that KBAST actually works, and sometimes even better than MCube networks, which are uh, more principled approach to doing these optimizations, is that they focus on the hard cases, right? You're, you're updating your parameters on the parse trees that are most likely to cause you errors, right? Um, and it could be the case that some tree with a very low score really breaks the constraints uh, badly, like some, some very bad tree that you're not going to pick out anyways doesn't quite have the right margin. Its margin isn't as large as you'd like it, but at the end of the day, you really don't care because that tree's so unlikely anyways. Um, so, by, uh, anyways, our intuition is by optimizing on the trees closest to the decision uh, boundary, you're really actually optimizing what you want. Because at the end of the day, we're just measuring accuracy over one versus second best, I guess. Yeah. You evaluate these things, you find one tree at the end, you don't find the probability of edges overall. No, no, we just find the single best tree, exactly. Yeah. So, um, years ago, the card problems, like noun noun modification, prepositional phrase, mm -hmm. the conjunction. Yeah. And um, um, I was sort of, and, and you can imagine some baseline, like in the PP attachment case, they define some baseline. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of wondering how the sort of modern approaches to PP or attachment or any of these hard problems compares to sort of these baselines. I mean, you, you see these performance numbers and they all go up and up and up. Yeah. Are they making progress on the classic hard problems? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if they do. I guess uh, my sort of feeling is, I mean, we, we always show accuracies over these, so we can actually break down our accuracies by how well prepositions did that find of their parents. And we can always measure them in terms of that, but my feeling is that the only way we can really measure uh, how good a parser is doing on various phenomena like prepositions and conjunctions is by how well that parse, how good those parses are when actually dealing with problems like machine translation and text summarization and things of this nature. So, yeah, it's hard to say. I'm not sure if uh, the new models are actually solving those traditionally hard problems in better ways. I wonder if you could look at, say, the, you know, the Hindle and Ruth uh, problem, you know, this PP attachment in a particularly constrained case. That's right, yeah. And there are data sets that were studied ad nauseum on those. Yeah. And then run the sort of classic modern parsers on these and see, um, are the parsers nailing those things, or are they sort of in the cloud with the rest, or are they actually at baseline? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a very good experiment to run. Uh, I, I wouldn't know actually if they're um, if they're actually beating. My, my 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 guess would be that they would be about the same as the sort of standard uh, models that just solve that very constraint problem. Uh, anyways, use the same lexical constraints that the best of those models use. Um, no, they actually typically use less constraints because the best of those models actually, because you're only trying to make a yes-no decision, basically that problem is set up. You have um, preposition, um, uh, the verb, and the noun, and you just want to make a yes-no decision. Does it attach to the verb or does it attach to the noun, right? And using that, you can actually define all sorts of rich features over triples of words, triples of part of speech tags, um, how those words were relative to each other in earlier sentences, and people use all sorts of really interesting features for solving this problem because it's a simple classification problem. But with dependency parsing, you're really sort of limited on the sorts of features uh, that you can use. Yeah, modern parsers are probably not doing as well. Yeah, you could argue that, but you also modern parsers do have, um, I guess, the benefit that they're actually parsing the whole sentence. So at the end of the day, there is some sort of global inference. Decisions are sort of made relative to other uh, dependency decisions. But yeah, I, I, I would, yeah, you could argue that I think that the sort of current modern approach to solving that limited problem would actually uh, be better. And one thing you could actually, 
No, it was, uh, it was uh, well, the, the, holes are the, the human judges were had the whole sentence to work with, but the uh, systems typically didn't. However, I think the systems used features from those four words that were yeah. richer than these. Yeah. And so the question is whether the features that modern parsers are using are better or worse than those features. And one thing you could actually, yeah. But one thing you could do, I mean, you can extend the standard trick. Uh, you know, we, we, we have add features over what um, other parsers think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like 80%, right? Yeah, it's like, I think it's like, it's close to, pretty close to inter-annotator agreement. It's like 86, 87. Yeah, and I know, I mean, our parser on just whether or not the preposition gets the right word is about 84%, so. Right, and that's probably got easier cases involved where there really isn't any, any choice. Of course, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it also misses a lot of the harder cases where there's multiple prepositions and multiple attachment signs. Yeah. Like yeah. this data set that they tested on was always Verb noun one preposition noun two. Right. And even if it's worse on, even if modern parsers are worse on that, those decisions, it's not clear to me that it's meaningful because it was set up as such an artificial problem. Well, right, but the general question is, is well, we see the numbers going up and up and up, but um, does it mean they're actually solving the problem, or is it solving some? Uh, in a while. Well, and you'll get to wear one of Franz's t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we know what our parser is doing when it's used, so then we can, you know, we can try Simon's parser and, and see what difference it makes. Um, I mean, since you can so, so nicely combine, you know, additional features that come from other models or classifiers or other parsers, um, is there any plan to sort of, you know, once you do a, a detailed error analysis to basically build specialized models to address exactly the problems where this is? Um well, yeah. No, actually, I, I don't have any plans, but that's actually a good idea. So you, you look at specific errors, like conjunctions, and can you actually design? A more powerful classifier. Yeah, specific, exactly, and add features. I, I, so honestly, the reason, the reason actually that we first started to add features over auxiliary parsers is because, um, a lot of reviewers complained when we submit our ACL paper that we weren't making an appropriate comparison to lexicalized context-free parsers. Um, and it's really a hard comparison to make because those parsers are trained and designed to maximize phrase structure accuracy. Our parsers are trained to maximize dependency accuracy. Um, you know, they're really trying to do two separate things, but a lot of reviewers wanted performance analysis, so we thought, well, we just throw this little experiment in to show them that you know, even uh, that we can actually do better if we just throw in these features. I actually prefer the parser just without all these auxiliary uh, problems anyways, uh, because uh, it's just simpler to run. I don't want to, especially when we have to, we're putting these into machine translation systems and the relation extraction systems. The more sort of auxiliary systems that we have to rely on are just going to sort of really uh, slow everything down. But yeah, you could do it. And actually, um, the max margin parsing paper at EMLP last year, they did exactly that. Um, they didn't look at specific cases like conjunctions or prepositions or whatever. They actually just had an auxiliary classifier that determined whether a cons constituent was a valid constituent. So it just made a yes no decision. Is this a good looking constituent? Is it not? And they added those features and actually that did. That actually brought their parser up to state of the art performance on the small limited data set that they actually uh, tried it on. Uh, but yeah, so I would actually imagine that you could, uh, you know, take these uh, classifiers that have been trained on that prepositional data and add features, whether or not they think it goes to that verb, they think it goes to that noun. I think you could actually um, really handle some of those cases. Did you use any morphological features? The check is all annotated, right? That's right. So we don't use... Um, we do what Collins did in 99. We just take a subset of that morphological, that, the morphology, the, um, the primary uh, part of speech tag. And I, yeah, yeah. And so we just actually treat it as though it has a normal sort of part of speech tag, uh, which is very bad. And um, a lot of people have actually brought this up to me, especially because people are starting to look at Arabic uh, to parse now, and that has a very rich morphology. And, you know, you would think with these discriminative parsers, you can add all sorts of really interesting features 
uh, over the morphology to increase performance. And uh, it'd be nice to, yeah, I should be doing experiments with that, but I haven't actually. I, I tried various combinations on uh, various slots of the check morphology and found that the original uh, Collins uh, subset of slots actually performed the best, and that's probably because they ran extensive experiments and found that performance-wise that was the best. So. Okay, well, thank you for speaking. I have various people lined up to talk with um, right during the day, but if you'd like to join us for a minute, we're going to dinner at 6 on the east side. Um, so just um, call me or send me a